Welcome to Case Closed, the Contingency Fee Podcast. On the show, our team of industry experts interviews contingency fee attorneys. You will discover everything from how they got started to the secrets of their success and what's working in today's marketplace. And now, here's the Case Closed Podcast. Good afternoon. We are here today to interview one of California's best and brightest how do I know Parag Amin? I read all about him prior to the interview to prep, and he's going to tell you his background, but folks, he's a super lawyer. So imagine Superman in a lawyer suit, uh, and he will tell you what the super lawyer designation means. I know it as an attorney. This is Max Mitchell Newman. And Parag, tell me your background, where you went to school, and how you started your career. Hi, Max. So my background is my parents are Indian immigrants. They immigrated here from India, and I was born in New York. And for undergrad, I went to University of Maryland. I grew up in Maryland on the eastern shore, which is pretty rural. If you've ever seen Friday Night Lights, it's kind of like Dillon, Texas. Very laid back. You know, everybody seems to know everybody. Small town, um, loved football. And then I came out to Los Angeles to go to law school at USC on a partial scholarship. And then where did you go uh, after you got out of law school? So I graduated in 2011. So you may remember that from 2008 to probably about 2012, because of the financial crash of 2008, the legal market was still reeling. And so when I graduated, I ended up actually doing contract work for large law firms which was glorified monkey work, as I referred to it, because a lot of doc review, yeah. I was clicking uh, through documents to see whether they were responsive or not to large cases like uh, antitrust cases, pharmaceutical cases, those kinds of things. And I didn't like it. And I thought about whether I really wanted to do that for my future. I, I projected my life ahead five years, 10 years. And I realized that that's not the path that I wanted. I didn't go to law school to represent big corporations. I went to law school to represent people and small business owners and that kind of thing. And so uh, I ch made the choice to start off with my own law firm about a year after law school in 2012. And do you mainly do plaintiff's work or defense work? Mostly plaintiff's work. We have the occasional defense side case where a client of mine has been sued by uh, a former employee, for example, or a competitor of theirs or somebody else that they've uh, done business with in the past. Please tell our listeners the type of law that you practice. What types of cases do you take? Primarily business litigation cases. So business disputes, we've carved out a nice niche with partnership disputes where co-owners of a business have started a business together. And for whatever reason, they can't get along anymore. So it's kind of like a business divorce where there's emotions on both sides. Um, there's there's a lot of history. Many times um, the partners will have certain uh, disputes or disagreements that they come to the table with, and that makes it a little bit more challenging when you combine the emotional aspect of things with the financial aspects of things. And it, they, those cases get very challenging to resolve because there's that emotional component and the financial component. But I really enjoyed doing those because it lets you apply a certain level of emotional intelligence to try to resolve a case. And then there's also a nice creative component where you can use their emotional intelligence to help craft better resolutions for clients that are actually financially much better for the client. Because many times what you'll learn in these cases is that one of the parties has certain emotional hangups for whatever reason that aren't necessarily logical, but that you can use those to help craft a better financial solution. And do you take most of those cases on a contingency? It's been a mix. So a fair number of them have been on a contingency and others will be hourly. If a case doesn't lend itself well to a contingency fee basis, such as there's there's issues, for example, with cross complaints and those kinds of things, then those will be hourly. But we've done a fair amount of contingency fee work and we've done really well with it. And what would you say is your biggest challenge in those types of cases? With contingency fee cases, the biggest challenge I would say is making sure that the interests are aligned because what happens is in a contingency fee case, the lawyer is essentially taking all or almost all of the risk. So we're putting up the money, 
for the expenses. We're putting up the time for the expenses, for the uh, attorney time. And I'm floating all of that overhead to get a successful outcome for a client. And so what happens sometimes is that because of those emotional components that we talked about earlier, what can sometimes happen is that there becomes a, an almost perverse incentive where the, the client wants to, to go ahead on a case, for example, push it to trial when all of the risk is on the contingency fee lawyer. What percentage, and, and this is a segue to, to your credentials, what percentage of your uh, contingency uh, or your cases are contingent fee? Right oh. now, I would say it's probably about half and half, 50-50. Okay. So I, I, I get to make a statement before you explain that he's a super lawyer. So to be an attorney who gets a super lawyer designation with 50% contingent fee cases even makes the designation that much more valuable because you're rated by your other attorneys, right? And in contingent fee cases, it generally can get quite heated because the interest of the lawyer sometimes might not be in line with the interest of the plaintiff, which you described. So your ability to identify those cases where you can align based on the emotional intelligence of your client, this guy, folks, is like a brainiac. So tell everyone about all the awards you've gotten, because I read your website and it was like reading Tolstoy, you know, award after award after award, go. I appreciate that. Um, so I've been rated as a super lawyer for every year from 2017 up until this year. And what that means is that's a peer recognition award. So less than 2.5% of attorneys, practicing attorneys in the state are actually awarded that. And your peers actually have to vote for you. And you have to be recognized amongst them as a lawyer who should qualify as a super lawyer. And so I won the Rising Stars Award because I'm under the age of 40. And so, you know, it's it's it is a prestigious award. It is difficult to get, and I'm I'm honored to have been and awarded that. And would you agree that it's more difficult to get the younger you are? Absolutely. All right. So again, Brainiac on the other side of the uh, computer. So how do you get most of your clients? It's a combination of things. We have a fair amount of referrals from other lawyers. And I think that is one of the biggest compliments that another lawyer can can pay me in, in my firm, which is to, to be willing to refer their clients over to my office to handle cases. So a lot of cases come over from business transactional lawyers who also happen to be friends and colleagues who don't handle litigation or may handle, for example, a demand letter. But then if the case doesn't resolve and the case needs to be litigated and potentially tried, they'll send that case over to my firm to handle it. Well, I see you have a lot of young lawyers uh, on your website. Uh, how are you intending to help the next generation of lawyers? You seem to be um, very uh, generous with your time based on what I've read. Tell me about that. Well, I think that mentoring is is such an incredible opportunity and we owe it to the world. For example, for me to get to where I am, there's been hundreds of people who have helped me, you know, in, in sometimes minuscule ways, but I appreciate all of them and I remember almost all of their names. And so I think that the best thing I can do is to give back. And so part of the mentorship is to to help younger lawyers make sure that they can find a good fit because the practice of law and particularly litigation can be can feel like an onslaught and it feels like it it can it can become very lonely if you don't have a good mentor to help you and to guide you because there are the the competency skills of being a great lawyer of being a great litigator knowing how to do the technical things such as draft discovery respond to discovery take depositions try a case so those are all technical skills but there's also a component to it of emotional intelligence, of emo emotional maturity that has to come with it. And unfortunately, the legal profession has one of the highest addiction rates because I believe of the fact that law school and a lot of our lives were not necessarily taught how to deal with the stress, how to deal with the constant onslaught of pressure and stress. And Part of what I like to do with the younger lawyers that I mentor or other individuals that I mentor is to help them with that, because I think a good, solid, strong foundation is the basis for all success. And so getting that foundation right is incredibly important. And then you can stack the technical skills on top of that. So segueing from that, when I was practicing law, 
there were a good number of lawyers who I will call hotheads. And uh, they would make litigation personal. And how how do you deal with that issue in your practice? Because I'm sure it, it's everywhere, even today. Absolutely. It's a great question. And so unfortunately, litigation seems to draw a lot of the hotheads. They many times will move away from or shy away from transactional work and go to litigation work because it seems to be that the, the stereotype is if you're a hothead and you know you, you want to be a lawyer, go into litigation because that's where you might be best served. But I disagree with that. I don't think that being a hothead serves you well um, in, in any form because ultimately, as the lawyer, you have to be the one who can be responsible, who can be trustworthy, who when you call opposing counsel, they want to take your call because ultimately, even as litigators, our job is to get the best outcome possible for our clients. And a big component to that is emotional intelligence. It's the ability also to take a step back and not yell at somebody and not get angry because it's very rare that yelling at someone or getting angry with someone will result in any kind of productive outcome, any kind of positive outcome. So why, don't you, why don't you give all the young attorneys who might listen to this the hack on how you diffuse a hothead? Absolutely. So I think first and foremost, to hack a hothead type situation is to take the deep breath, relax, and don't react. I think a lot of times people think that if somebody does something, they have to immediately react as if it's something happens and then you have to react. But that's not the case. And for example, for me, I use meditation as a technique. I've used meditation for a few years now, and that's helped me tremendously because what will happen is you'll have a stimulus and there's a gap there between the stimulus and your ability to respond. And the more you meditate and the more mindful you are, the longer that gap can become. So somebody can get in my face and yell at me and I can remain relatively calm, even if somebody's right here yelling in my face because of that practice. And I would say that ability also helps you use the more uh, evolved parts of your brain because the amygdala is what's responsible for emotion. And that's the most primitive part of your brain. Reptiles, lizards have amygdalas and that's responsible for sensations like fear, anger. And it's one of the oldest parts of the brain whereas the prefrontal cortex is the newest part of the brain. And that is what makes humans humans. And our higher level of logic, reasoning, those kinds of things come from the prefrontal cortex. And it's shown that when you get really heated, the prefrontal cortex actually starts to shut down and your brain forces more blood into your amygdala, which is the emotional part of the brain. So your higher level functioning actually shuts down when you get heated and when you get angry. So the best thing you can do is to remain calm to the extent that you can. So when you get, I think there may be an interplay with what I used to do and what you're talking about. I'll see if you do this in your deposition. Uh, you never want uh, a, a person you're defending in a deposition to get emotional in a deposition because then they don't listen to the question and they answer something they didn't hear, wasn't asked. Do you train the people who you are defending in a depo to take a breath take one, two, three, four seconds before they answer a question? Absolutely. Absolutely. And what I tell them is take a breath. Just take a breath. Relax. Think about the question. Think about the answer and then respond. And that'll give me an opportunity to object. And that'll also give you an opportunity to think about the question that was asked so you can actually answer that question and only that question. And do you use that same technique in mediations? Absolutely. Uh, in mediations, you'll have mediators come back. You know, the other side said this about your case. They said this about your case. And here's where your case is, is problematic. And this is why no jury is ever going to believe your case. And that's why you should take these peanuts and pennies on the dollar. And the ability to take that and listen to that when your client's there in the same room and remain calm, I think instills a sense of confidence in your client. And it lets you come from a place of confidence of, of being able to respond to the accusations and the statements factually and without emotion. Knowing that you do this in all aspects of your case, that I think is probably, and see if you agree, is one of the reasons you're considered a super lawyer. I like to think so. Okay. What is your most famous case? 
my most famous case. Uh, my most famous case would be uh, I had a client who, well, actually, let me ask you this, Max. What what do you mean by famous? Ah. Is it the one that received the most press? Is it the one that's most near and dear to my heart? And, and this is why he's a smart lawyer. I didn't define famous. He comes back and forces me to define famous so we can properly answer the question. That's what he teaches all of his people who are going to get to post. So we're going to give famous in three different ways. So I'll get three answers. One that had the most press, one that changed the law the most, and one that made the most money. Okay. So the one that had the most press, I represented a famous artist who's played at, at venues around the world, including California's famous uh, music festival, Coachella. And so what happened was at the height of the Me Too movement, he was accused by a girl of uh, committing the heinous act of drugging and raping her. And this accusation was made years later. And normally, I don't take these kinds of cases. And my thing is, any case I take, I have to firmly believe that I'm doing the right thing, as opposed to just taking cases for money. It's very important to me. And I also think I can best serve clients that way because I truly believe in their case. And I talked to this musician and I talked to him about what had happened. And he explained to me what happened. And in fact, there was a third party eyewitness who had seen the interactions and was there for almost the entirety of the interactions and who happened to be a friend of one of the girls. And based on that, based on that testimony that we got, because the case was filed, we actually filed a, a defamation suit. So he went uh, on the offensive just to get the truth. And ultimately, no money was exchanged, but there was a joint press release that was issued by both of them talking about the Me Too movement and the, the issues of consent and what it means to have a meaningful dialogue before two adults engage in any kind of sexual acts. And it's the only case in the Me Too movement where a joint statement has been released by both sides. And that helped his case tremendously in terms of helping him in his career, because unfortunately, you know, especially today, I think that it is, it is an extremely sensitive topic, and, and rightfully so. Unfortunately, many legitimate accusations have been swept under the, rugs, under, under the rug for decades, and people haven't gotten their chance to have a voice. But similarly, I think that it's unfortunate if somebody is accused of uh, a crime, especially in this situation, it was one time, one person who did it. It wasn't decades long of accusations, such as some of the other people we've seen in the news. It was a one-time allegation from one person. And again, the, the person's friend, that individual's friend, was the one who ultimately stuck up for my client and said, well, you know, that that's not exactly what happened. And so that for me, I think, was an extremely successful outcome under the circumstances because yeah. when he got accused of this, he was immediately his tours got canceled. Everything got canceled. Again, this was the height of the Me Too movement, and nobody could take a risk. His career come back after the joint press release. Yes, his, his career has continued to increase after the press release. All right. What's the most famous change in the law you made, case law that you made, that's gone up to some court and changed law in California or in the country? Well, I don't know that my cases have... have I don't know that one of my cases has gone up on appeal and actually changed the law. So, okay. you know, I don't want to say something that isn't the case, but I will say that um, one case that's near and dear to me that made me uh, a lot of money was a case that I took on. It's not even the type of case that I normally take, but what happened was a friend of mine from law school referred this client over to me and it was in December and inevitably, I get these kinds of calls uh, in December for whatever reason. And December 25th is my birthday. And so what I do is like, especially if it's an elderly person or somebody who can't afford legal representation, but they need help, I'll take that case on essentially as a pro bono case. And so I take this case on where this elderly lady lives in this apartment building that's got three stories. And so she lives on the top floor of this three-story apartment building. And what happened was the elevator that would take her from the third floor to the first floor kept breaking down. 
And this apartment building just didn't replace the elevator and they didn't fix it. And so what would happen is she would be stuck sometimes in her upstairs apartment for multiple days because the apartment company simply wouldn't make the fix that they needed to make for the elevator to continue working. And she called the management company and said, you know, I'm having trouble getting out of my apartment. I'm actually running out of food and medicine. Can you please fix the elevator? Or can you please help me get food and medicine? And the woman who picked up at the management office told her that's not my job and then hung up. And so I got involved in that case, fully expecting this case to be a pro bono case. I just wanted to help this lady. And so we signed the case up. We litigated the case. Uh, I think it ended up being litigated for about a year and a half, maybe two years. Uh, but that case ultimately ended in a settlement for $1.1 million because this lady uh, was Were, Was it trapped. under what, uh, negligence or under the Americans with Disabilities Act? What did you sue under? Great question. It was under both. So we, we sued under the American with Disabilities Act. We sued under the California UNRU Act to allow for attorney's fees. And then we also pled negligence. And what we found out during discovery, and this was the key that really made this case so valuable, is that we found out from discovery that the defendants tried to hide from us, from answers they refused to answer. So we issued subpoenas, they moved to quash. And we issued discovery requests to get information about what their budgets were and how much it would have truly cost to fix this elevator. So it turns out, Max, that it would have cost only about $7,000 to fix this elevator. That's why and, attorneys are needed, because that's ridiculous. And so $7,000. And so during a deposition and during a key deposition, I asked the person, well, why didn't you fix it? Well, she said, well, you know, we didn't have it in the budget. I said, oh, really? She said, yes. And I said, how do you know that? She said, well, I, my manager told me that we didn't have it in the budget. So these documents that they fought us from getting actually showed that not only did they have that money, they had over $50,000 in cash reserves for just repairs. And then we found out that they had over $40 million in just cash reserves unrelated to any specific reserves for repairs. So they had plenty of money to make these repairs, a $7,000 repair for this elevator that kept breaking down, that they simply refused to fix because they wanted to hold on to more money. And that's what really made the difference. So we ended up leaving or moving for leave to amend to add punitive damages. And that was granted by a judge who's typically viewed as more defense friendly. And that's what I was told by, by several of my plaintiff's lawyer colleagues that this judge is 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 more favorable typically for the defense because that is his background is that he he was a defense lawyer and even this judge saw how ridiculous it was and allowed us to to amend to add punitive damages and he said well let's let the jury decide and we did more discovery and we we found more things that were really problematic for the defendants and so not only did they pay her so she could move out of this housing um, but what was incredible was she donated a significant amount of this money to charities around the world. And so she made a positive influence, not only, you know, in her life, but in multiple other people's lives. So she was yeah. able to turn this tragedy into triumph. Folks, this proves that when you help someone else, they will uh, help people with the help you gave. It's uh, uh, paying it for it, and she paid for it. Do you do any mass tort work? I do not do mass tort work. Uh, how do you discover new types of cases to file? Well, so typically what will happen is cases will come in and there'll be uh, most of the cases come from referrals from other lawyers or former clients. And what's interesting is these kinds of cases will come in and, and we'll analyze them for the potential causes of action that we have. So I'll roundtable them with my lawyers and we'll think about what potential causes of action do we have here and that's typically how we end up filing new types of cases and new types of causes of action, as opposed to going out and finding new cases. So um, do you do Title Three ADA cases on websites, thanks to California's unique law? No. Ah, okay. You're familiar with the California law? I am. Okay. Uh, what would be, you would say is the thing that drives you the most crazy about what you do uh crazy in a bad in a bad sense or in a bad, bad sense. sense in a bad sense i would say 
my biggest issue is when people flout the rules, especially lawyers in the judicial context and judges will let it slide. For example, deadlines, if somebody doesn't meet the deadline and a judge says, well, it's okay, they almost met the deadline. You know, no harm, no foul. Well, I think that that encourages ultimately people to not meet deadlines. They don't treat them as seriously as they should. Or when people play games with discovery and judges don't order sanctions, when we file a discovery motion that we spent a lot of time and money filing, and then ultimately judge says, yeah, you were right, but then doesn't award, uh, uh, doesn't award sanctions and attorney's fees. And I think what happens is there becomes a perverse incentive where people will do what they can get away with. And if judges in the legal system continue to let people slide on these kinds of things, deadlines, mandatory sanctions, then I think inevitably what happens is the system gets increasingly backlogged. And what happens is that there's an increased incentive for bad behavior. Because if, for example, in the case that I just talked about, not giving us the discovery that they were supposed to, if they can just fight it, and most plaintiff's lawyers won't file the motion to compel because it takes a lot of time and money to do that, well, then they've won. And ultimately, when we did file a motion in that particular case, we got nominal sanctions for the amount of time it took. Now, of course, it paid off in the end, and that's why we did it. But I would say that you know accountability is huge for me. So do you find that to be less prevalent in federal court versus state court? Absolutely. I will say the federal court, a lot of lawyers are... are not comfortable in, in federal court for whatever reason. Yes, there are more rules. Yes, they're more stringent. Yes, that judges will hold you more accountable. And yes, judges can be more free in awarding sanctions or sanctioning lawyers, sometimes thousands of dollars if things aren't done correctly. But I think what happens when that happens is there's a higher level of accountability and it'll draw better lawyers or make better lawyers when they're practicing in that arena. And it really gets rid of a lot of the gamesmanship that tends to occur in state court because state courts are so overwhelmed and so overloaded. Well, for this is your last minute to tell the world what you want to tell them. So go ahead and tell them. OK, uh, well, I would say that being a lawyer is, has been a privilege. It's something that I always wanted to do since I was a kid. Um Around the age of three years old, my dad had taken his life savings and, and put it into this convenience store in Florida. And what happened is he bought the entity, the company that owned the store and the Florida franchising uh, franchise taxing authority came and told him you owe hundreds of thousands of dollars in back taxes. He said, well, that's, I, I couldn't possibly owe that kind of money because I haven't made that kind of money. So the reality was the person who owned this entity before him didn't pay all of his sales taxes. And that then fell on my dad. And so my dad was forced with the unfortunate ultimatum of you either pay the taxes or you close the store. And my dad chose to close the store. And ultimately he gave up on his American dream of entrepreneurship and ended up getting a W-2 job. And not that there's anything wrong with it, except for the fact that he wanted to have a store. He wanted to be an entrepreneur. And so that left a lasting impression on me to become a lawyer and fight for what's right. And I feel so privileged to be a lawyer and to be able to help others. Well, folks, if you're in California and you need a lawyer, Hire Parag because he's the man. I haven't met many lawyers that are as eloquent as he. And you can see in his eyes, uh, we as lawyers judge people by their facial expressions quite often, body movements. He is as honest as the day is long. Well, thank you for today. And that'll end the interview. Thank you, Max. Thank you for listening to another episode of Case Closed, the Contingency Fee Podcast. We hope you enjoyed listening to this week's guests and their insight. If you liked what you heard, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. Case Closed, the Contingency Fee Podcast is led by industry experts who unlock insights from the nation's top contingency fee attorneys. Each week on the show, the guests share how they got started, secrets of their success, and what's working in today's marketplace. Guests on the Case Closed podcast include successful contingency fee attorneys that will share their secrets so you can close more cases. Tune in each week for a dynamic conversation about winning legal strategies that will grow your business.